before we start, I wanted to, well, actually to tell Andre, for example, um, yesterday I had uh, a little time to, uh, well, I wanted to show you, to answer your question from yesterday about joints uh, definition. Um, uh, let's allow Angelica to enter. Okay, so I wanted to show you how you can define joints and also at the same time why I told you it's, it was quite boring and I prefer to move on. But I will share this definition with you. Um, I already prepared it so that you will be able to um, you will be able to to see how it works. I will I will quickly right. go through it. Um, I I made a slight change to yesterday's um, definition. This uh, simple truss. I also simplified the number of spans that we have. Just reduced it to to four spans, so it it moves uh, faster doing um, optimization. I also changed the uh, supports only here at the base, and not. Uh, at the top corners of this truss. And I applied, uh, besides the vertical load here on top, I also applied an horizontal load so we can uh, more clearly see what happens inside this truss when you want to define joints. Um, but actually, um, the, the first consideration is that when you uh, want to define a specific joint, you cannot work with uh, a truss beam. Uh, because as it is not capable of bending, uh, basically the joints always stays like remain like rigid joints. So you cannot um, free up any degree of freedom uh, because basically they, they don't have degrees of freedom. So that's why the joints when you uh, display joints in uh, uh, in this uh, model view and you select the joint visualization, you only get this orange uh, scheme where everything is rigidly connected and nothing changes during simulation. Okay. Uh, so if you want to work with joints, uh, you must uh, uh, deactivate the bending uh, capabilities. Um, so you must set this to, uh, to uh, true. Okay. So you see that, that beams can bend. Of course, remember that this deformation is exaggerated. Uh, it's not the actual deformation. You must read the values if you want to know how much deformation you are getting in this area, which is the most uh, deformed. But then you see, for example, that uh, this is the, the only joint that I have uh, programmed, and now you're going to understand why it's somehow uh, boring. Um, in order to define a specific joint, uh, you must use, uh, well, as we saw yesterday, uh, let me, uh, the order changes each time you open grasshopper, so you must find the uh, proper Tab, but you see in, in Caramba 3D, you have cross section and you also have the joint definition. Okay, uh, now this is the easiest way for defining a joint, uh, like directly uh, telling Caramba that you want to define a joint, a specific joint, at the starting node or end node of one specific element. So I choose the element uh, P5, so the principal uh, beams or the principal elements, number five, and I am applying. A, um, a joint with this uh, characteristic. Now, the way that this works is uh, somehow counterintuitive because when you uh, define, for example, some support condition, if you want this support to affect translation and rotation, then you check these radio uh, buttons here. Uh, in case of joints, if you want to free a degree of, if you want to yeah, set one degree of freedom free, then you set, check this uh, radio button here. So it's like the opposite from, from support. Uh, so in this case, for example, we are allowing um, a rotation uh, around the Y axis at the end point, the end node of element P5. Um, I also um, wrote down this uh, here in order for, for you to understand how uh, these uh, uh, beam joints work. Um, you can easily get why it's uh, boring. You should. Uh, th there is a, a series of, of considerations that you must that you must do before uh, knowing exactly what you want to do. For example, I also uh, I also display here the um, where is it the local axis. You see, and this is important because uh, let me um, 
yeah, okay, let me go to cross section. So uh, it's important because in order to understand what's the end node of one element, you must understand what's the orientation of the element. So for example, this node is the end node for P5, also for this element, for this element, but this element, for example, if you want to, um, to specify the same rotational condition in this node, it's the start node for element P6. So you must study the orientation of all the elements inside the, the system in order to understand what node you want to define as, um, in order to free some degree of freedom up with this uh, radio button here. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, show you is that uh, once you define, for example, in this case, you free rotation, um, you, you set rotation around the y-axis free at this uh, uh, node, you can also program or define a, uh, let's say, rotational strength or rotational resistance in terms of kilonewton meter uh, per radians. Per, yeah, this is the, the uh, radians means the, the angle, rotation angle. And so basically this is going to affect how much this element can rotate along this, uh, around this uh, axis. Of course, this depends if you have already have a pre-stressed or something in this, uh, in this area. Uh, so in this case, I will leave it to zero just so that you uh, can see that if I deactivate Ry, then we go back to a rigid joint, which is exactly uh, the one that we have from uh, the um, non-bending uh, trusses. So actually, if I free this up, I allow this beam to rotate around this, uh, this joint here. Um, so you see that in this case, you no longer have the orange joint definition which is just basically the rigid amount of beams that converge inside that node, but you have uh, the visual um, uh, symbol that tells you what degree of freedom is set free in, at this node, but only remember for this element, not the other ones, okay? So if you want also the other ones, you must also plug uh, other uh, identifiers here in this uh, thing. But remember that, for example, if I want to, uh, allow all the beams converging inside this node to rotate around the y-axis. Um, this is going to be the end node for element P5, this one and this one, but it's going to be the start node for element P6. So I must define another joint where I can specify Ry at the starting node of element P6. So I must use two of these. Okay. So that's why it's, it's a little bit boring and it's a, a long process when, if you want to define all the joints at all the intersections of the end. Okay. So um, I hope this uh, clarify things a little as regards the, the joint definition. Of course, uh, you can have a visual feedback as soon as you activate uh, or set free one of these uh, elements. You always have this, uh, well, actually, it, this is the front view. So it's a rotation, but you can see it in three dimensions. This is the, the Z rotation, okay? And this is the Y rotation. Of course, in this case, as this is a planar system, uh, Rx and Rz are basically not affecting the, the deformation uh, for this uh, system because it is only working in the, the XZ plane. So the only thing that affects it is uh, the Ry degree of freedom. And of course, you can also do something, some things like weird things, like I want to set free the X um, translation for this element at this node, and then you will have some kind of weird behavior in, this, uh, in these areas. Uh, so, uh, yeah, basically, it, it makes sense to free up eventually the Ry rotation in this case. Um, and you can see um, how this uh, object here works when you apply this uh, load here on the left. Of course, remember that actually uh, these beams are capable of bending, but uh, if you want to uh, know the maximum displacement that's happening here in centimeters is 12 centimeters. So uh, you must set, remember, deformation to one. And this is the actual deformation that the system is getting in this area. Uh, this is also an optimized uh, version because I also ran uh, the, uh, the Goldfish plugin yesterday. So you can see the thickness of this uh, element is actually the optimized thickness. And this is something that, um, well, actually it's, uh, it's uh, um, pretty understandable. So you have a, a uniform load here applied on top, which is basically a, a affecting proportionally all the structure. And then there is this load here um, pushing the structure to the right. And then you have some more um, rigidity needs, especially in this area and in the final 
uh, beam here. Uh, mostly the diagonals here are, are stressed, so that's why they are thicker at the end. So everything looks, uh, looks fine in this case. Um, and also I wanted to uh, tell Ariel, uh, forgive me, I didn't have the time instead for um, reviewing your definition that you sent. So I don't have a, a solution or an answer for uh, the problem that you were saying uh, yesterday yet. Uh, eventually I will, uh, um, I will review it uh, later today. So uh, I will come up with uh, a solution. Un unless you already found the solution, I don't know uh, if you already... Uh Okay, don't, don't worry, Carlo. Okay. I don't know why I have that uh, error because in Still other the same definitions, ev everything, everything works in other definitions, uh, okay. just in cases. I don't know. Okay, but, okay. Uh, I will, I will, I will it review good. it. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so what we're going to do uh, today is uh, complete the, um, um, the, the um, optimization. Um, uh, the optimization uh, process, uh, per, but this time we're not going to work with frames. Uh, we are going to work with shell uh, structures. So um, not not beams, but but shell structures. Um, it basically is going to be quite similar. We are only going to to uh, take a look at the, the functions that we must uh, use in order to perform this kind of analysis. Uh, the excuse is going to be once again a catenary structure. So uh, let me. Uh, just activate the first um, part here, which is once again kangaroo, as you can imagine. Uh, so this is going to be the mesh that we are going to use, but you can define whatever mesh. The method is exactly the same as uh, as yesterday. Remember, uh, try to avoid uh, um, meshes with, uh, with with some problems, uh, topological problems. So um, just in order, well, when you have this kind of simple system like this uh, simple mesh here, is not that difficult. Uh, so, for example, um, we see that this mesh is uh, uh, somehow problematic right now because you see that this mesh uh, says it has 16 vertices. Okay. Now, it's very simple to understand when a mesh is problematic in the, when when it is so simple because you only see two, four, six, eight, ten vertices. Okay. So that's the amount of vertices that you should you, you should get from this uh, uh, tip here. So B shouldn't be 16. It means that the faces of this mesh are not properly joined together, or the mesh is not weld. Okay. So uh, one thing that you should do in this case, remember, do this in Grasshopper. It's easier somehow. Uh, try to use the weld mesh. I say try because remember that that uh, Rhino Grasshopper are not the best option for mesh modeling. So you see that now we have 10 vertices and four faces. Okay. But this it, always double check what happens. Um, because if you um, if, if you are in need of, of welding a mesh, uh, even if the mesh is, is complex, it means that you already have a doubt about it. So always double check the amount of vertices here at the input and the amount of vertices here at the output. So if you don't see any difference, it might be uh, either the mesh is not problematic at all or the weld mesh is not working. There are several reasons for this uh, component um, to fail. Uh, we are not going to, to go through this, but remember that working with meshes somehow can be problematic in Rhino Grasshopper. So always double check that the input data here is, is correct. Okay. So in this case, I weld the mesh and pass the mesh to this. Um, it's, uh, if, if you want, um, I can also uh, show you one of the consequences of not having the proper uh, inputs. If we go to uh, Kangaroo, there is a utility which is called naked vertices. And naked vertices extracts all the points, all the vertices from a mesh, but it divides them between um, into naked points and clothed points. So naked points you see are the, the points that face the outer uh, space of, uh, with respect to the body of, of, of our mesh. And the clothed points are uh, in the inside of the mesh. So if I take this, uh, um, uh, this quad divide applied to this mesh. I take the quad divide because um, in our original mesh, basically there are no clothed points. All the vertices are facing the outside, you see. But if I take the quad divide, I also have uh, interior vertices all along this, uh, these lines here. 
So if I apply the naked vertices to this code divide here, I start seeing all the vertices of our mesh. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven clothed points, and we have 20 naked points. So somehow you see that it's, it's I would say it's quite stochastic. Um, so um, there is no uh, particular, um, uh, you, you cannot be certain of anything when, we, when you work with meshes. But I can assure you that if you don't uh, work with a proper mesh, you might have some weird result. For example, you should have also naked points inside your mesh. So some of these points could also be, um, uh, let's say, detected as naked points. And so if you are planning to work only with naked points because you want to anchor the mesh, for example, along the boundary, and you want to use naked points as, as anchor points, then this, this component would also give you some anchor point in the inside. So always double check that things work properly. If you do this, if you work with the weld mesh, you, you can be uh, a little more, let's say, sure that things are going to work uh, properly. Okay, so weld the mesh, subdivide the mesh, and uh, at this point, um, we are more interested so yesterday, we were more interested in lines because they were the edges of the deformed mesh. But today, we are going to consider the, the mesh itself. So we can run the simulation. We can wait for this simulation to reach to an equilibrium status. When it says converged, it's going to be quite fast because I'm using a very low resolution um, object. This time, I'm working uh, at a very low resolution because um, the optimization of a shell, we are going to use Caramba 3D uh, first, and it's going to be slower. Okay, so it's better to show these things in, in, at a, a low resolution. Uh, so this is the, the actual catenary uh, structure. Um, I'm going to turn off the preview of the uh, output mesh from, uh, from uh, Kangaroo, and I'm going to activate the Caramba 3D components so you see that now we have a totally different preview uh, I'm also I'm always visualizing the output from the model view which is basically the detailed uh, uh, view of the model with reactions supports and loads and nodes and so on okay and also I am also displaying this time an, a different uh, component which is called shell view um, yesterday we were using the beam view okay um, so in this case, there are um, some, some differences between uh, the, uh, the, the yesterday's uh, uh, session. Um, let's go through this because there are some differences also when defining the model itself. Okay, so I'm going to turn off uh, everything right now because we don't want to get disturbed by uh, the preview. But mesh, first of all, um, triangulation. Um, I did this triangulation uh, mainly because uh, I want to have uh, uh, more uh, more control over the, uh, the, uh, the the analysis of this mesh. Um, triangulation has two effects. This is not we were discussing this yesterday. Remember, uh, it's not exactly um, correct in terms of uh, structural analysis. I mean, we should work with the actual quad mesh that comes out from from uh, Kangaroo because by doing this, we are changing uh, the actual uh, structural uh, behavior. You know? So we are adding, for example, some um, divisions, some diagonals, which are not present in the calculated mesh from, from uh, uh, kangaroo, from mesh or deformation. Okay? So this could actually work a little different from a real catenary structure. So this is just to have more resolution inside my, my model, okay? my analysis. So, uh, if you are keen to have mo a more realistic result, you can skip this uh, triangulation here and work directly with the mesh that comes out from, from um, Kangaroo. Okay. Um, you see that um, here, for example, um, this, uh, uh, this, this slider here, or well, this uh, gene pool here, um, is uh, defining the heights. Now, uh, in order to, uh, to define the model, this, in this case, we must work in, uh, not with uh, frame element uh, like beams, uh, but with shells. So you see that this component here and also this component here are not uh, frame element anymore. They are shell elements. So if you go 
here in uh, Caramba 3D and you go into the model, you see that um, here you have lines and there is also the shell components. So mesh to shell uh, is basically converting a flat mesh or a mesh with no thickness into an element with thickness. Um, so that Caramba 3D can understand that this object is not just a single sheet of uh, material. It, 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 has, it has some thickness. And the thickness is called cross-section. And you see that cross-section is not a, a different component. If you uh, go, uh, for example, uh, here, cross-section Caramba 3D, this is exactly the same component that we used yesterday. But instead of having a eye section, you can select the shell, um, the shell uh, variable here. You can define a shell by a, a constant thickness or a variable thickness. I'm interested in considering a variable thickness. Okay, so if you change this to shell var, then you have exactly this uh, aspect here. Uh, this also happens. You saw it yesterday with loads. So loads uh, are just one single function, but you can decide what type of loads, and then this component changes accordingly. Um, so, um, the, the only important thing that we must uh, um, uh, check here is, for example, the values uh, of heights. Okay? So, I'm using a gym pool uh, with a range between 10 centimeters and 60 centimeters. Okay? Because heights, you see that once again, is in centimeters. So, always double check what unit you must use when defining this, uh, these aspects of your model. Okay? And, and unfortunately, um, some software like Caramba 3D use centimeters, some software use meters. It, you never know, so always double check until you are uh, you get used to and you know perfectly what's the requirement. Um, so the thing is how many uh, heights we must define here. Um, you see that it, it, it says in a, the, the, the description, the list of heights are mapped on the list of faces. Okay, so not vertices. This is important because normally, uh, when you define some mesh properties in general, uh, these properties refer to vertices. So, for example, mesh normals are calculated with correspondence to vertices and not faces, which is something counterintuitive, once again, but it, it, it's something that you must consider. So, in this case, we must uh, know how many faces our mesh has. And if we triangulate this, we can use the deconstruct mesh count the elements in the faces. We don't, we don't care about uh, the information that we have here inside. You see it's T19, 18, 25. This is the connection scheme of the vertices of the mesh in order to obtain one single triangle because it is triangulated. We only want to know how many elements we have here. So list length, 32. And so as I'm using a different mesh from the last uh, time that I used this uh, definition, because I have defined a, a different mesh, actually I'm using the mesh um, a, a very simple mesh this time, you see? So uh, I must count how many faces we have, it is 32, and adjust this gene pool accordingly. If I don't adjust this, remember that this component will work with the longest list. So the last thickness uh, or the last height of our mesh will be applied to um, the remaining uh, 18 faces because uh, 14 to 32, we have more uh, we have uh, 18 faces more than these values. So change this to 32. Uh, we can keep two decimals. We can keep this range is quite fine. I think 60 centimeters is more than enough for this span that we have here. And that's it, basically. Um, I would eventually, just in order to make things uh, clearer, the reason why I did this, uh, let me move this uh, here as we did yesterday, so it's clearer the, the, the reason why we are calculating this uh, the amount of, uh, of faces. Um, and the materials. Um, material selection, uh, well, simply I'm using simple concrete here. Um, of course, you can use whatever material you might want. Uh, I think concrete in this case is going to produce some kind of uh, weird deformation eventually, uh, but we will uh, check this uh, in a while. Um, when you see in Caramba 3D, um, well, actually, uh, I think I updated uh, the software recently. So you see that it's uh, immediately it marks this as an old component, which is the loads component. Um, this is not a, a, 
well, let's say uh, a problem. Um, normally, if, as long as you see your, your definition running smoothly with all the components like gray or standard gray, uh, there is no problem. But I do recommend that you update the old component. Um, they, they can be old component from standard Grasshopper or from plugins, but I do recommend that you update them, okay? Because maybe uh, at least they could have uh, some uh, a more efficient way of calculating the output, so it's uh, less time consuming or, or uh, resources consuming. So just try to keep your definitions uh, updated. Um, and the rest is basically uh, what you already know. So you have, uh, we have supports here, at the very corner of our uh, of our uh, mesh, you see just the uh, corner touching the ground, um, and there are loads um, which are applied to uh, only to to the mesh uh, because they are set to mesh load constant. Okay, so I'm not changing in this case. We could uh, we could use a mesh load variable and so on, but uh, I'm just applying a constant load uh, on top of this. Uh, uh, object like, I don't know, like if it was something like snow or something like that. Um, and uh, orientation is global. So uh, remember, uh, it's best in this case, always to apply a vertical load in this case, because it is a vertical Z negative, um, applied vertically with respect to the world coordinate system, not to the local to mesh. Uh, if you apply this uh, local to mesh, just so that uh, we have a clear understanding if our mesh has these faces oriented like this and you applied a vertical load but locally to the mesh the load instead of being applied vertically with respect to the z-axis is going to be apply, applied vertically according to the normal direction to the mesh object so in this case you will have normal load applied like this and then in this phase normal load applied like this and here normal load applied like this Okay, so we, we don't want this in general, okay? Uh, it's very difficult to have this kind of load distribution in, in real life. Um, okay, so global, uh, it's okay. And the okay, rest uh, 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 let me ask you a question. Yes. Why not gravity? Uh, you, can, uh, you can add gravity if you want. Um, if you want, you, of course you can do it. I do recommend that if you want to add gravity, you just take another load and leave this to gravity. Vector by default, it should be, yeah, it's zero, zero, minus one. And you simply plug this together with the additional load here. There is, there is absolutely no problem with this. And you will see that during the model visualization, um, if you uh, activate the model view, you will have this. And of course, um, the, the intensity uh, must be set at the vector level. In this case, as you are using gravity, uh, you could also uh, uh, manage vector collection here. And instead of using 0, 0, minus 1, you can directly say minus 9.81. Uh, so you will have this. Okay? And this is being applied to, to the whole model. Okay, it's just, I, I am not using this because, well, in this case, as I'm working with a uniform mesh load constant, it, it makes no difference. I'm just adding a, um, to this uh, gravity load, I'm adding a constant load, okay? But so it makes no difference. But normally, uh, in order to explain this kind of thing, I, I don't use gravity because it, it is uh, pretty simple, pretty straightforward, okay? But you can do this. Um, so this is assembling the modeling the usual way. There is absolutely no difference um, because there is no shell model. Okay, so the model is the model. Uh, uh, the, the element in this case um, is going just to be a shell instead of uh, uh, some beams. Okay, uh, supports, loads, as we saw now, and cross-section in this case is not a, um, a I cross-section or whatever beam cross-section, it's a shell variable cross-section, depending on this uh, gene pool. Uh, so we already know an idea of uh, the, um, uh, why do we have a tree here? We should not be getting a tree. Oh, I think it depends on the, on the loads, okay? So load, for example, must be provided as list, you see? So if you don't provide a, a list, you have two separated loads into two branches. So basically loads here are a data tree. And so it's, it's always the same principle in Grasshopper, the longest list. So we have one list, for example, of uh, elements, which is the only one, but it will interact with two different load cases. So if you want to be sure 
of, well, not making this kind of rookie mistake as I did, I do recommend that, for example, you take a uh, load container, which is something like a, a, a number container or number parameter here from a standard grasshopper params uh, tab. Uh, Caramba has its own parameters, as you can see. So this is the load. And if you want to avoid this kind of, of mistake, always connect your loads to a load container, both of them, and you simply uh, flatten this. So if you do this, you avoid um, making this kind of, uh, of mistake. And you just plug the, the Caramba 3D uh, load parameter. Um, so in this case, you see that there is no longer a data tree coming out from the assembled model. There is just one mass value, which is correct, of course. Um, center of gravity, we already know, but the important thing is, is, is the model. And this is the analyze um, uh, component. We already know this, we already use this. Um, and this is the model view. Now, the model view is actually showing only, um, let's say, um, the analytical aspect of, of uh, the, uh, of the analysis. Okay? So we see how the constant load is actually affecting uh, the mesh at the different vertices. You see that uh, loads, for example, are represented at the vertex level and not at the face level. Okay? While thickness is going to be assigned to the face itself. Um, you have deformation. Uh, actually, deformation is being represented at, C at, its, uh, at the proper scale. Uh, so uh, deformation comes from maximum displacement. So it's 2.53 centimeters. So it's uh, quite a small deformation. It depends on this uh, on these uh, values here, of course, but it's actually uh, pretty small. We should double check this after the optimization. Um, but you can see that uh, this object is basically tends to, well, let's say collapse this way. Okay, so we have uh, a an understanding with this deformation of on how the model could, uh, could work. Oh, basically, I'm going to increase this. I wanted to increase this, actually, because uh, I need uh, to uh, have a clear understanding of during the optimization phase of how the, the model deforms according to the different solutions that the optimization algorithm is going to find uh, along the way. Um, I am not going to show the loads. I don't want to see the loads. Uh, I don't even want to see uh, the node tags. Uh, basically, uh, I don't need to see anything during the, the optimization process. Uh, so I just want to see the mesh deforming during the, opti the optimization process. And before running the optimization, I'm going to show you also the, um, the outcome of this uh, analysis. Well, there is this, uh, which is basically just a, a um, geometry, a custom uh, uh, geometry visualization uh, component. You just select the material, which is a color with, with or without transparency, in this case, semi-transparent. Um, but these are the outputs that we are interested uh, in. Um, this is something that yesterday we saw this when, uh, I don't remember who asked, uh, maybe Ariel asked, how do I export the analytic values for stresses and forces from the frame analysis? This is the same thing, but applied to uh, the shell. So in this case, we have all the values for normal stresses and uh, and moments and shear and so on. Um, but I'm interested in, in the uh, analyzed model uh, from uh, from these shell forces. Um, so in this case, for example, there is uh, nodal displacement. Uh, these are uh, basically the uh, displacement of each node of our mesh. Remember that nodes, uh, if you want to uh, uh, node, if you, you can activate the node tax so you know uh, which node is displacing and how much. Okay? So uh, eventually node number zero corresponds to uh, the um, uh, translation, node of translation, uh, the first uh, of these node of translation values. And it's in meters. Now, this is actually vectors. Okay, So if you want to uh, know the value in this case, uh, you can use, for example, a uh, vector uh, sorry, I, I have to type it, vector length. So in this case, we also know uh, what is the um, value of the, uh, of the node of translation per node. Okay. Um, so this is an, an important information, but you can also use this uh, for, uh, for example, 
uh, let me let me see where do I have this uh, oh okay I have this mesh here so uh, if uh, I want I can also display uh, this uh, this vector like in order to understand what direction each node is moving uh, to and also there are, there are nodal rotation which is also another important uh, parameter in order to understand how uh, this uh, uh, this node is, is affected uh, from a, a rotational point of view according to the elements or, or that are surrounding it so this is uh, quite another analytical information that might be useful during uh, uh, the uh, the precise analysis of the behavior of this structure. And this is the, the standard um, uh, view that we have for the uh, resulting model. This is uh, some somehow like the, uh, where is it? It's not like the beam view, okay? But in this case, we are interested in, in the three-dimensional mesh. Um, so in this case, the, how, how do we read this? Uh, you see it's yellowish, uh, but somehow you see that this area is lighter than this one. So the lighter the yellow, the thinner the mesh. So you see that now we are, you, you are seeing the thickness, the actual thickness of the shell structure. And you see that it's becoming thinner in this, uh, uh, in this area, and it's thicker, for example, here at the top. Um, I also uh, made uh, this uh, uh, screenshot because I'm also using this for exporting it, it to, to Revit uh, architecture. So this is actually a screenshot uh, that allows to clearly understand what's the variation of, of such a shell structure in terms of thickness. And this is after the optimization process, of course. So you see that it's thicker as, as it goes down towards the ground and it's thinner uh, uh, at the top, which is something that we would expect from this kind of, uh, of configuration. Um, so, so yes, basically, if, if you want, we can also uh, leave this uh, uh, on instead of uh, the standard mesh, but this is another layer of uh, time-consuming processes. So uh, during the optimization, I'm not really interested in seeing, uh, having a visual feedback for the thickness, I prefer to uh, work only with the, the model view and eventually keep things under control by leaving these two values here like visible in the in the in the window in the viewport. So this is going to be the maximum deflection. This is going to be the mass of our structure. Let's see what happens when we uh, try to optimize it. You will see that in this case, um, the uh, optimization process tends to be a little slower. Um, but this is pretty normal, okay? And also one thing that I also expect here is that uh, as I am trying to optimize the maximum depression against the, the mass of this thing, um, well, it's, and, and we are using uh, basically a gene pool, which is uh, uh, a series of thicknesses for the faces. I expect uh, to see that uh, the maximum deflection is inversely proportional to the mass simply. So we start to have this kind of distribution here. Um, let's also activate the history. But I do expect to have some kind of uh, hyperbolic distribution of points, uh, of course. So um, just basically, I, I don't think there is uh, a different approach to this, uh, to this problem. But let's double check. Let's let, it, let this optimization run uh, for a couple of iterations, couple of three iterations, uh, nothing, not more than that because um, you see it's pretty slow this time. So uh, here you have an information if you want. Uh, the ETA for this uh, optimization process with 100 iterations, remember, it's defined here. And each iteration with 100 variations is going to take more or less 50 minutes. Okay, and, uh, and this is uh, basically the average uh, population evaluation time, so each a variation is being tested in, in uh, less than one second, but uh, it's, uh, 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 this value is higher than, uh, um, uh, sorry, this is uh, less than one second. This is uh, actually the, the population evaluation time. So we are getting a new iteration each 30 seconds, more or less. So it's quite slower if compared to, to yesterday. But you see that we tend to, be, to have this kind of uh, uh, hyperbola style uh, graph. Uh, each iteration, you should imagine this uh, uh, iteration by iteration, so you see that you always get this kind of uh, hyperbolic um, uh, graph here. 
you see it's one after the other. But anyway, um, let's complete the fourth iteration, and then I will pause this and see what happens in terms of uh, our shell. Um, unfortunately, also yesterday during the trust analysis, um, um, it's it's quite a time-consuming process, so it's boring to like to stare at this screen and watching this thing changing. But um, yesterday, when I ran the optimization for, for the trust, um, uh, it's, it's uh, also nice to see that uh, iteration after iteration, you see that the changes that you have inside your model uh, becomes, uh, let's, let's say, um, smaller and smaller, you know? So it's nice to see that when the optimization process uh, already, it is already running for, for a while, you see that deformations become smaller and smaller because it tends to find the optimal solution. So at that point, you might also interrupt the, the optimization uh, algorithm if you want, because you are already close or very close to the solution. And I'm going to reinstate um, something. For example, I don't want a, th these are centimeters, remember. So we have here, for example, the lighter structure is actually uh, producing a, a maximum displacement of 2.5 six, seven, eight, nine, this is something like 82, something like uh, 2.83 centimeters. But it, it makes almost no difference between two centimeters, three, three, three centimeters with, with this pan. It's absolutely identical. So I do prefer to you to optimize the mass in this case. And so I'm going to reinstate this and, and close this. Remember that data is stored inside Goldfish. So in, in, in any time you can uh, go back here and reinstate a different um, scenario, basically. Here are the correspondent thicknesses for all the faces. And if we take a look at the model, now we should have a um, more variation in the, in the yellow. And you see that we already have lighter yellow in the upper parts. Okay, so it's something that was easily predictable. So uh, this is the, the actual uh, also, let me turn off the, um, why do I see this? Yes, these are the, the principal, uh, the principal stresses uh, orientation uh, from the mesh. So um, it's, uh, it's these arrows here, these small arrows. Uh, they are represented in, at the original mesh level. So you see that they are in between uh, exactly at uh, half the thickness of the face. Uh, these are the directions of the principal stresses uh, inside the mesh. Uh, you can also increase their, their scale if you want, uh, but you see that uh, it's just uh, uh, to understand, you know, to understand what's the orientation of the principal stresses. Um, let me um, hide them. And you have several different uh, options uh, as the uh, beam view, of course. You can simply visualize the cross section. So this is the yellowish representation. Uh, eventually, you can also visualize the, the principal stresses, which are something, some, some information which can be important you know, to understand how this, uh, this structure is, uh, is working right now. You can also visualize the displacement, which is the usual pinkish um, representation. So you know what part of the mesh is being deformed uh, more or less, and the usage of this uh, of this uh, structure in terms of the dark blue is uh, the, well, I would say uh, the more stressed part. And of course we, as expected, the white areas are more on top of this, uh, of this structure. But nevertheless, this is uh, our uh, variable thickness uh, uh, shell optimized according to gravity at this point and also an additional load like the one that we have defined. Uh, the bad thing about this object here is that um, they are two separated meshes, okay? It's not one single solid mesh. So you see it's absolutely empty inside that it, miss, it misses also the, uh, the side faces, okay? So it, it's a little bit tricky to, uh, to rebuild a, a solid uh, mesh or a closed mesh in this case. Uh, I uh, created this uh, little um, script here uh, which works um, in this case. I'm not sure it's going to work uh, uh, always because it depends on, on several things. And uh, once again, I, I uh, want to point out that working with meshes is somehow tricky in Rhino and Grasshopper. But in this case, what I did was extract the two meshes 
take the uh, edges of the two meshes. I'm interested in the naked edges, so in order for you to understand, it's all the uh, boundary of uh, the boundary meshes of the two layers, basically. And um, uh, these uh, basically are should be actually. So this is something that eventually I'm, I, I would not be so sure. Uh, it's something that I would double check. Actually, I did it. Um, and I simplified and grafted these edges because I want each edge to loft with the correspondent edge. So when I do this, I am getting all separated surfaces uh, from a couple of correspondent edges. And then I convert each surface into a mesh with one by one polygon in the two directions. And then I mesh uh, join using the Weaver Birds join meshes and well because it does everything in one single operation. Okay, so it's joining and welding the mesh. And if everything is uh, is uh, correct, you can bake this. It should be one single object. And the way that you can understand if a mesh is actually a solid mesh or not, you can go into shaded mode and you start to see, for example, in this case, you, you see through. Now, this uh, is not a, um, this is not telling you that the mesh is not closed or it's, uh, it's open. Um, you can use, for example, a clipping plane uh, like uh, like this. Um, actually, I think that yes, this mesh has some kind of, of problems. Eventually, it could also be some uh, only a, an orientation problem. Uh, so, uh, in uh, Grasshopper, this is something that you can do in uh, in Grasshopper. Uh, there is this unify mesh component that, uh, that tries to uh, solve uh, the orientation problems in uh, in one mesh. So let's get rid of this and let's take this uh, final mesh and uh, bake it. And you see that now everything is perfect. So when you uh, slice a closed mesh with a, a cutting plane, you should only see the thickness, like a solid thickness. Uh, this is telling you that the mesh is perfectly uh, closed and that it has no orientation problems, okay? So now we have a solid mesh uh, corresponding to our uh, shell. And you can analyze the thickness and the variation of the thickness at a different level by doing this kind of, uh, of section. Okay, so it's pretty clear uh, how the thickness of this shell is changing. Um, you can use these for for um, producing like uh, uh, technical drawings or or whatever. Um, the only thing that uh, that uh, I would suggest in this case, for example, is that if you want to work with this in Rhino you should convert this into a NURBS object. And um, this is something tricky because the only way that you have in Rhino to convert this thing into a NURBS object is to use the, the mesh to NURBS um, function that simply takes each polygon of the mesh and converts it into a, a, a surface. So it will have a poly surface in this case. If you run the command mesh uh, to NURB, you have this object here, this poly surface. Now, um, it might look like a good solution, but uh, for those of you who uh, already have some kind of NURBS uh, knowledge, all these faces here, all these surfaces are problematic surfaces because they are not topologically correct. So they are triangular, triangular surfaces, but they are twin surfaces. So uh, it's, it's different. For example, let me get rid of this clipping plane. It's, uh, if I explode this uh, and take this face and delete it, the proper surfaces should be something like this. Oops, sorry. Uh, like end, 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 this end point again. This is a regular surface with the isocurves intersecting inside the surface, not this one. So you might have lots of problem if you work in a NURBS uh, workflow with this kind of faces here, while it, you have no problem if you have this kind of things. So, two types of problems. First of all, you, you get a, well, especially if you're working with a high resolution mesh, you get a, an extremely complex polysurface. And if you have triangular faces, you also have this kind of topological problem. Okay, so it's not like I simply convert this into a mesh, uh, into a polysurface and, and that's it. Uh, it depends on what type of, uh, of operations you are going to, to perform. Um, and one last thing about this, uh, this uh, uh, shell uh, um, um, solid representation, that once you have this uh, regular mesh, closed mesh here, you can uh, perform a, a um, thickness analysis by simply applying a contour command 
to uh, this object. Remember that contour works with uh, almost any type of, uh, of objects. So you can select what direction you want to use for the contour analysis. In this case, I'm going to use the uh, Y direction. Um, and uh, I am going to define a distance like, I want to know the behavior like uh, every 50 centimeters. And so we will have this uh, uh, contour representation. For mesh workflow, you recommend make, migrate to other software? Um, uh, well, it, it depends, Ariel, it depends, because um, there are some operations that you can perform here like uh, pretty easily, uh, but from, for complex operations, yes, I do recommend that you uh, move to other platforms. So, uh, for example, just so that, that you have uh, um, another important information about uh, this kind of uh, of uh, simulation that we are running, okay? Um, the initial deformation of our mesh is calculated by, uh, by Kangaroo. And Kangaroo uh, is, is another plugin that is based on mesh, okay? So if you want to work with uh, three-dimensional object in Kangaroo, you must convert them into meshes, okay? Now, uh, what we are doing here is just taking a very simple mesh with four polygons, four quads, and simply subdividing it using a quad divide. But we always get quads. And the topology of this mesh is absolutely regular. So um, if you think about it, we only have a grid of quads, a regular grid of quads. So you can see a U orientation, B orientation, or U direction, B direction inside this, uh, this topology. But the topology is also affecting the way that this object deforms during the simulation. Okay. So, for example, one test that I was running recently uh, was to use uh, something like um, a different topology in order to have, uh, let's see if I have something here. No, I don't have it. But yes, but I have the, uh, for sure, I have the, the Instagram publication, which is uh, basically this one. So in this case, for example, the topology, this is exactly the same dome, okay? Exactly the same mesh, but using a, a mesh a modeling tool, which in this case is Blender, I, I changed the topology in order to don't flow in a UV uh, fashion, uh, but instead of having something like uh, this uh, UV grid, imagine uh, like you can take this topology that you see here, let me grab a, a pen, so in order to clearly explain it, uh, you can alter the topology in a program like, like Blender and maintain, for example, this stripe of quads flowing like this, you know, like this. And you can mesh edit somehow in order, for example, to create one quad here, one quad like this, one quad like this, and one quad like this. So in this case, your topology will be flowing like this and the same thing on the other hand you can do something like this and so you will have topology flowing like this okay so you are changing the topology of your mesh and this affects also the deformation with uh, from from kangaroo processes but this is something that you cannot do easily in in rhino or, or on the fly in rhino you must model these face by face and uh, you also have some problems because you must get rid of this edge and of this edge in order to have a corresponded quad division between these two flows that you have here. You cannot have edges uh, reaching uh, the midpoint of one uh, edge from an adjacent phase. Okay, so you also must get rid of this and of this. And then everything is going to work perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, so, yes, I do recommend that you uh, have a look at, uh, at what are the, um, the, the capabilities of, uh, of Rhino in terms of topological editing uh, for the meshes, of course, and eventually migrate to other software if you want to do some particular um, tricky uh, changes, okay? Because this affects the whole process. Um, so... Uh, so yes, basically here you have a, a very uh, interesting analysis of uh, how thickness changes um, um, every 50 centimeters in this direction. And you can do this in, in every direction. There is also another output in, uh, in, uh, which is interesting in, uh, in Caramba 3D, 
which are the um, uh, the stress lines, okay, and also the result the, the, the vectors uh, of the principal stresses and also the uh, values of principal stresses. So the analytical information is available through these result vectors on shells. Okay, so you have here you have the nodes, and here you have the principal stresses, both in in terms of vector, so direction and values. Okay. Uh, and you can decide what type of uh, information you want to extract, principal force or principal stress. It depends on what information you are interested in. And this is applied to the points of the mesh. Okay? And just so that everything is clearer, the points in this case are the center of the faces. Okay? So this is referred to faces. Um, and then there are the, um, the stress lines. So you see this is the stress lines uh, uh, distributed on top of our mesh. Uh, their, um, their resolution or their aspect depends on the resolution of the original mesh. Of course, we have this kind of very uh, low resolution stress lines because uh, uh, our initial mesh is extremely low resolution. Um, the way that these are created are source points. So you must distribute uh, points along this mesh. You can do this in a random fashion like I used here a populate geometry. I don't know why this Z vector is here, but anyway. Uh, you can simply use a populate geometry, or if you want a more regular uh, distribution of stress line, uh, you can also adopt uh, different uh, different um, uh, rules, basically. So um, once we have, uh, for example, this um, um, triangulated mesh, or also you, you could also use this uh, quad mesh, I guess. Um, here, I think everything is based on the triangular. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's because the when you split a quad into two triangles, there is some deformation going on because you are cutting a quad along its diagonal. Um, so it, it's more uh, correct to use this in, in this case um, in order to populate geometry. Because in this case, in this uh, moment, the points lie exactly on top of the of the mesh uh, triangulated triangulated mesh. Um, but you can also use uh, different things. For example, um, there are uh, something, some comments like uh, divide, uh, let me see if, uh, at least we can use a divide surface um, or, or uh, surface points or something like that. So we must eventually go back to a surface representation or, or nerves representation for this, uh, for this mesh. Um, but you can also create a grid of points. That's the, the thing, a grid of points uh, inside each mesh. And in that case, you will have a more regular distribution of points uh, along the way. Uh, and you will have a more even separation between these stress lines. Well, eventually I will insert this uh, other solution uh, in, uh, in this definition later on, uh, but um, it's, uh, well, it is not that complex. Well, actually let's do this. Okay, so, and let's also try if we can use the original quad mesh because it's going to be uh, simpler and more uh, regular distribution of points. So if I take this object here, um, we can uh, use commands like uh, mesh explode, which gives us access directly to, well, let, let's use this one, to uh, each uh, face of our mesh. Basically what it's doing is converting one, fa one face of the original mesh into one separated mesh. So we have 16 meshes right now. Um, and then we can uh, uh, deconstruct, deconstruct phase. Let me see what it is. Oh, yeah, it's this one. Deconstruct phase. Um, in this case, remember that phases, um, uh, normally when you deconstruct a mesh, let's see the difference. When you uh, deconstruct a mesh with the deconstruct mesh component, uh, you get phases as an output. Uh, remember that faces as output of the construct mesh is not the actual faces, the actual polygons, is the connection scheme. So in this case, you can use the deconstruct face in order to understand which corner you must connect in order to obtain exactly that face. But when you use mesh explode, you obtain exactly the faces. So if you want to obtain the connection scheme of the vertices and rebuild a quad surface, you must pass the mesh explode through the deconstruct mesh, which is something ridiculous because we are exploding one single face, but we need this connection scheme. So when we have the connection scheme, 
in order to extract the four vertices that would be the four corners of our surface, we can use a list item. And from the list of vertices, we can extract, uh, let me move uh, everything else a little down. So we have more room for our definition here. So we can extract the first corner of our uh, faces. So this is just the first corner. Uh, you can refer eventually to, um, let me see. We can refer to this face here, to this polygon. So you see that this vertex is this vertex here. And we still miss the other three, okay? So if I copy list item and use now list B, you will see that this one is the upper lower left, and this is the, uh, the lower right, sorry. Lower left and lower right. And now I also need the upper right, here it is, and the upper left. So now we have four sets of points and we can create a, uh, what was the, the name? We can create a four point surface. Four point surface connecting corner A to corner B, they are grafted because they belong to separate polygons, so it's it's uh, correct. Now, connecting three of them, we already get triangular faces along the mesh. This is something that you can also use for um, production uh, reasons or also for creating alternative representation of your object. It, it depends. You can do many things with this kind of, uh, of techniques. And once you connect also the fourth vertex, then you have the quad representation. But this time, this is no longer a, a mesh. This is actually surfaces, separated surfaces. So these are 16 nerves surfaces. And uh, right now, you can go in utility, divide surface, take each of these panels here, divide it into as many points as you want. Well, I would not recommend you use uh, 10 by 10 uh, as a count because you get 121 points per uh, quad. So it's quite a huge amount of points but you can use a five slider, for example, and plug it here and also here. And so we get a more regular distribution of points. We can use this, uh, um, this uh, point cloud in order to derive the uh, stress lines uh, along the mesh. But before doing this, I would also recommend that you uh, take the remove duplicate points from, from Kangaroo uh, flatten this input, send the point cloud, which is uh, divided in, in a tree structure. That's why I'm flattening the input. Uh, this is because we are getting uh, coincident points along the edges of uh, each surface. So we are starting from 576 points and we are getting 451. Okay? And then we take these points and send them to the sources. Let's see if it works because we remember that this point, they don't lie on the surface itself. And then we have this kind of more, uh, well, actually way more dense representation of the, of the stress lines, uh, but at the same time, they are more evenly distributed. They are not random, totally random. Okay. Um, but anyway, you can switch between them and uh, it, this is a little longer. Uh, fortunately, this is something that if you want to do, you do it once and then you have it available and you can copy paste it whenever you want to use it. Okay, so that's one of the uh, advantages that we have when we use Grasshopper. Um, so I will leave it this like here so that if you want, you can use it. Um, and the alternative is the random population of points. You can simply increase or decrease the amount of points in order to have a, a denser representation of, uh, of stress line, or just if you want to have an idea uh, of this. And you have the stress lines are um, divided into two sets, of course. So you can also work with the uh, um, first principle stress direction, like this, or second principle stress direction. Okay, so it depends on what you want to achieve with this, uh, with this analysis. Actually, I'm doing uh, some studies in order to uh, create some structural variations on, uh, based on this, uh, on exactly on these lines. So I want to uh, create some nice structures uh, based on the stress uh, inside the, uh, 
the, the object inside the system. Uh, so basically in this case, it would be uh, somehow uh, like giving more thickness to the shell uh, along these uh, stress lines, for example, in order to make it more resistant, uh, but also aesthetically more interesting. So this is something that I'm doing right now, but uh, I'm not ready to, to share this kind of information because it, I still need to uh, further uh, investigate. But anyway, um, this is the, uh, the shell analysis in, uh, in, uh, in Caramba 3D. Nice nerve separation for hacking the mesh. Yes, but yes, but remember that, um, that you see it's it's quite tricky uh, here in in Grasshopper, but you can get to a, a nice result. Uh, just remember that um, if we are working with an extremely low resolution object. Okay, so doing this with uh, a high resolution mesh is already becoming quite heavy as as a process. So or it, it it will be affecting all the the rest of the so just do this, but uh, pay attention to how uh, uh, slow the definition is, is, is getting when using these kind of techniques. Uh, but in general, this is something very, very um, interesting to use because once you have the, uh, the surface representation, you can use uh, um, standard grasshopper methods for deriving some uh, other applications inside this, for example, uh, I don't know, you can, for example, evaluate this kind of object, which are separated panels right now. Eventually, you can also flatten them because you don't need the, um, the data tree structure in this moment. And also, we can uh, um, reparameterize this kind of surface and we can use a multidimensional slider in order to derive whatever point along the surface and also the orientation of the surface. So we can use this information to draw on the surface whatever kind of things that, that, that come to, to our minds. Uh, so I don't know, an alternative representation of, of a frame structure for this could also be like um, extracting the uh, BREP wireframe from these panels. Um, I'm also going to, to flatten them because we are already getting a data tree here from the wireframe. Sure, yes, you see four edges per panel. Um, and we can also, for example, um, uh, deconstruct BREP. So once again, let's flatten this, uh, this input because we are going to get uh, data trees here as an output and we can also explode these surfaces. This is going to give us uh, access to, uh, well, actually, I think that the wireframe is, uh, is useless because we already have the edges from, from here. So we basically have the, the center point and the, the four corners and also the edges. Okay, so if we, for example, uh, take the center points, which are 16, and then we have the vertices, which are four per panel, and they are subdivided into 16 branches. So if I graph this, I can also create diagonal frame elements by connecting with a line, the center point of each panel with the vertices of each panel. In order to have a different uh, uh, representation of this, uh, of this structure, that this could be also an alternative um, uh, frame structure that we can analyze, further analyze, analyze with, uh, with parameter D and see what happens if we do this kind of uh, variation in, uh, in, inside this uh, uh, frame system. Uh, I don't know what is going to happen in this case. Um, it, this is normally something that you can uh, do in order to create a diamond uh, pattern in, instead of a square pattern on, on top of a surface. As you can see, these are diamond lines. But um, there are also other methods for doing this. Um, I'm going to quickly show you uh, because this is another change in the topology, uh, both of the mesh and of course for the structure that we are going to analyze uh, later on with Coramba or Millipede or whatever. So once we have the, the uh, initial topology um, in, uh, in Coramba 3D, uh, sorry, in Kangaroo, see how important is, uh, is uh, Kangaroo itself, there is a component which is called diagonalize. So you can do this automatically at the mesh level and this is going to be the result. So in this moment, you will have a totally different representation um, for the mesh. This is uh, uh, good, for example, in order to, uh, um, 
you see, for example, that if you work with the uh, quad mesh, the standard quad mesh, um, we basically have no problem with the deformed version because we are just anchoring the mesh with correspondence to these six corners. So these edges are able to, to rise up according to, um, to gravity, basically, to inverted gravity. Okay? Um, what happens if we decide to anchor all this mesh along the whole border? So in that case, we have a, a weird situation that I'm going to show you because it's another um, Im important uh, configuration of, of this kind of system, where you have a dome that touches the ground all along the, the boundary. So imagine that you are creating some kind of dome for covering some, you know, it's, it's uh, um, quite usual to see this kind of structure for covering um, um, like tennis courts or, or something like that. Okay, so let's say that you want to create that kind of structure, okay? Only with gravity, not like an inflatable dome. We are not going to discuss this, but uh, like a, a catenary uh, dome. So in this case, if you work with a quad uh, mesh, you have uh, a problem. So uh, the way we can do this, and in this case, I'm going to um, turn off uh, the actual mesh that is sent to Caramba 3D. Of course, we, you must rerun uh, the optimization. And, and the analysis. What I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, use a, we already saw this, a, um, what is it? Uh, naked vertices, here it is. Uh, so I'm taking the, the naked points of my mesh, which by the way, so that it's uh, a little clearer, we can take this uh, point container and uh, show only the naked points. And so we can easily understand that the naked points are the points that are along the boundary of our mesh, while the crooked points would be these ones. Um, in this case, in order to have a better representation of this dome, which I'm going to reset, by the way, uh, I can also increase the amount of subdivision because it's ridiculous to have a dome just with this uh, limited uh, deformation possibility here, just with this low amount of, of uh, subdivision. So I'm going to increase this to four, for example. Um, remember that each time you do a, a, a topological operation on the system, you must reset kangaroo. Okay, this is very important. So I'm going to use all these naked points as anchor point. See, so uh, this point container here is actually being sent to the anchor point in Kangaroo and also to the supports in uh, Caramba 3D. You see this wire here. So I'm just shifting these wires from this container to this other container. So now our mesh is anchored to the ground all along the boundary. And I'm going to reset this. And I'm going to run this simulation. So here's the result. Now everything looks quite good, right? But there is a... a an extremely weird situation in which if you take a look at these the corners here, there is a diagonal edge, like the diagonal of this quad is, capa is capable of rising up because this vertex is moving up. But then, and this happens in this corner, in this corner, but then if you take a look at this other corner here, you see that the diagonal lies flat here on the ground. So the first triangle lies flat, and the second triangle is capable of rising up because this vertex is free to move, okay? Now, it depends on the orientation of the diagonals of these quads. So a quad, in the end, is always subdivided into triangles, at least during the simulation or at least in rendering. And unfortunately, what you see in render is what you get uh, in, in the model analysis. So if I pass this mesh to uh, Caramba 3D, Let's wait for it to recalculate. And we take a look at, at, at the triangulated version of it. You have exactly this situation. So this is something that you don't want in your model, of course, especially if you have this kind of, of dome here. So when you anchor the dome or the system to the ground all along the boundary, uh, doing this kind of uh, diagonalization, let's call it like this, it's important because if you do this, uh, the difference is that the quad mesh has its diagonal 
that are alternated according to the even or odd vertices or corners. While if you diagonalize the mesh, you always have a diagonal edge with correspondence to the corners, you see? So this problem will never occur. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, in this case, if I want to work with all the boundary anchored to the ground, I will shift all these cables to the diagonal mesh and I will diagonalize the mesh. And so now, of course, I have to rerun the uh, kangaroo uh, simulation. It's a little stuck. Oh, I think it's stuck because kangaroo is actually calculating uh, because I didn't uh, turn the simulation off. Uh, that's why it's, uh, it's running so slow. Pretty sure about it. And also because um, this is this is what I was saying uh, yesterday, uh, yes, or the first day. Uh, don't ever leave Kangaroo running, and Karamba 3D receiving the information from Kangaroo while it's running. Because actually, Karamba 3D is calculating each iteration of the uh, deformation that it's getting from Kangaroo. Okay, so that's why it, it has become so slow. So I need to wait. Uh, now that the process uh, more or less ends, it's actually receiving the inputs from my mouse while I was trying to move things around. So that's why you see that things are, are displacing a little. It should now, uh, uh, let's say, hide the preview of this thing, probably. I'm trying to um, zoom out so eventually I can uh, stop at least kangaroo. Sorry for this, I forgot to turn off kangaroo, but this is real life. So it's important also for you to have a um, clear understanding of what problems might uh, rise when you forget to do things properly. So let's wait for the, yeah, it, it's off. Uh, we, we are almost there. Yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, okay. So I can stop this right now. And you see that we are back to normal. Um, so don't ever leave this uh, uh, on, or at least turn off the preview or the, sorry, uh, deactivate the component uh, that is sending the information to Karamba 3D, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, let's uh, go back to normal. Now this is going to be our mesh. We can also, uh, well, let me, let me turn off this. Let's take a look at what happened to our structure. Uh, we can uh, leave this uh, running right now. And also, in this case, when you diagonalize, uh, there is another problem. Um, the diagonalization uh, alters the, the way that um, naked points or naked edges are uh, detected. Okay? So, for example, if I take a look at these uh, naked points here, you see that some points inside the mesh are detected as naked points. So, this is a problem. Okay? Now, how do we solve it? Well, in, in this case, um, we can do several things. Uh, you can also go through a trial error uh, process. I do recommend you take the, 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 the shortcut. Um, so for example, um, what could be the shortcut in, in this case? Um, you see that naked points is actually detecting all the actual naked points plus some, well, let's say, wrong naked points on the inside of this mesh. So I do recommend that you use this uh, tool for deriving the, the first uh, generation of naked points and then get rid of the uh, wrong naked, naked points. How can we do this? Well, we can use a, a, an attractor uh, method. So for example, uh, if we take mesh edges and we, we don't use diagonal mesh because if we use diagonal mesh, as there are fake uh, naked points on the inside, there will be fake naked edges on the inside. So if you take a look at these curves here, like naked edges, you will see that there are some naked edges, green naked edges here on the inside. It's, it's evident that they are fake naked edges. So it's the same problem, okay? But if I calculate the naked edges for, from the original quad mesh, the diagonalized process will maintain exactly the same edges the same naked edges as the original mesh, as you can see, okay? So there is no difference between the naked edges of the quad mesh and the supposed naked edges for
for the diagonalized mesh. So we can take the naked edges, we can join them together in order to obtain the, the outer boundary of, of our mesh. Okay, and then we can simply find the curve closest point starting from these naked points here and projecting them onto the border. So we are not interested right now in these points because you see we also get this projection here uh, in between two vertices, two naked vertices for our uh, uh, mesh. Okay? We are interested in the distance because when one of the naked points lies along the boundary, which, is, which are the points that we are interested into, the distance will be zero. Okay? So we, we can use many uh, criteria in this case, but I would say that if distance is similar to second number is going to be uh, zero. If it's similar to zero, it means that the correspondent naked point lies on the boundary of the mesh. So you should see here true, false, true, false, and so on. And so you can call pattern the naked, the so-called naked points, basically, we are going to call some of them according to this uh, similarity pattern. And therefore, we should get uh, more or less the point that lies at zero distance. Now, if you see this, only some corners are detected, then you can increase the threshold. Remember that um, this is a computer. So it is calculating the distance down to several decimal numbers. Okay, so you can increase the tolerance, for example, the threshold. Actually, it should be 0. Point something, 0. 0.1, but you can also increase this. It's a, it's a percentage value, so it's between 0 and 100. If I set this to 0, eventually some points will disappear as well. But no, it's quite precise. But if I try to increase this, you should see that at a certain point, we should see points appearing. If this doesn't work, because sometimes it doesn't work, as you can see, you see that it switches between nothing, zero to 100, basically, okay? So in this case, this method is, uh, well, it's, it's not good. You can use another criteria, for example, smaller than, and evaluate, for example, if the distance is smaller than a certain value. Um, the problem here is that you see that there are these values here, 4.3938, multiplied by 10 at the power of minus eight. So that's why the threshold was not working, okay? So um, at the same time, uh, you see that the distance of this point is higher than one, probably. So let's take a, a second number like 1.00. And so we finally get this true, 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 true. Remember that at first it was true, false, 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 because there was some very small value that, that grasshopper is not capable of calculating properly. And so if we do this, we should get to a proper result, as you can see. Eventually, if you get this, it's because it's closer than one to the H, and in this case, you just decrease this value. Yeah, and you see that it disappears. So when you see that the, the actual uh, points are the naked points that you are looking for, then it's we are done. We just send this to the actual uh, point container that it's sending the points. Oh, actually, I think I should say naked points projected to uh, the, the outer edge. Yes, like this. The surface was flying because I I was creating a loop, uh, and uh, and this cannot happen. So there were no anchor points at that moment. And so yeah, now we have our diagonalized mesh anchored to the ground, and you see that we no longer have that kind of flat triangle problem at any of, uh, of the corners, okay? So you see that, um, well, actually we are discussing structural analysis, but at the same time, it's important to understand uh, this kind of uh, standard grasshopper procedures um, that, uh, that allow to solve some specific problems. And this is also something that affects the topology, the mesh topology in the end. And so the structure in this case is going to be uh, totally different from the previous one because it's, uh, basically sorted along the diagonals of our initial mesh. And it's going to be eventually more elegant, as you can see. So I'm going to turn off this. I'm going to reactivate uh, the, um, 
component that sends everything to uh, Caramba 3D. And now, of course, uh, everything was optimized, but we have to change a bunch of, uh, of things. First of all, we have diagonalized the, the mesh. So we must double check. We have 256 faces because we also triangulated this mesh. And here we have only, how many things? 32. So we must increase this to 256. Uh, it would be also interesting to perform a frame analysis on this because the mesh is pretty uh, interesting, pretty, pretty elegant. Uh, this is the only thing that we must, uh, um, let's say, adjust probably because, uh, um, because yes, I think it's the only thing that, uh, that needs to be changed uh, according to the, uh, to the operation that we did for the diagonalization. Uh, so these are, this is the new model uh, and we must also perform an optimization in order to optimize the thickness of this uh, structure. You see that it looks uh, pretty weird to have uh, this uh, bright area in this uh, region of the mesh and then everything is intense yellow which is uh, absolutely counterintuitive. So eventually we must run uh, the optimization process. Um, once again, I would, everything is basically uh, the same. Uh, there is no reason for uh, changing anything uh, else, unless you want to change the loads or something. Uh, every, everything is anchored to the ground. You see how many uh, fixed support we have here at the bottom. Uh, but anyway, let's see what happens in terms of, uh, of optimization. Let's run this uh, for a few iterations. Uh, so, of course, we must uh, uh, reset right now and start calculation. And you see that now it's running uh, with this lower, it's double the time uh, than the previous uh, session. So first it was something uh, point, uh, 30, if I'm, not, if I'm not wrong, and now it's uh, more than double that value. I also think that uh, due to the amount of elements that we have right now, I also think that this uh, object, oh, um, well, uh, this is something that uh, I was, uh, uh, let's say, not uh, seeing. Take a look at how these diagonals are running through the triangles. See, this is something that we don't want. So in this case, this depends on the triangular, the triangulate uh, component, okay? Is this one, that is triangulated these spots, and the, the way that the diagonals are are, um, are created, it's uh, well, it's not actually um, unpredictable, but it depends on factors that we cannot take under control. Okay, so in this case, for example, I would recommend that we. Oh, by the way, I think that it, it was because Caramba 3D needs the mesh to be uh, triangular. Yeah, because Caramba 3D is doing this automatically. Yeah, that's because I, I also placed a triangulate component here. So in the end, if you want to um, uh, do this, this is another uh, aspect, for example, uh, Ariel, that uh, if you want to adjust the topology in a very specific way, you cannot do this with uh, automatically in Grasshopper like with a simple triangulate component. Um, so for example, uh, you see that even if you don't triangulate the mesh, Caramba 3D is doing this automatically, and you have exactly the same effect. Um, so the reason why I put this here is also to control uh, what happens inside Caramba 3D. So as this component is actually the first one that you put in your definition, you already know if the triangulation is going in the right direction or is producing a totally unwanted result. Uh, how can we uh, regularize this uh, the way that diagonals are, are uh, um, created inside this model. But um, we can use some, uh, um, uh, well, another trick uh, eventually. You see that uh, we have these uh, diamond panels here. What we want to split into triangles are only the quads, okay? Um, and so in order to split the quads, we first must isolate the quads from the triangles because we don't want to split the, tri the triangles, of course. And so uh, once we have this mesh, or eventually the mesh that comes out from, uh, from uh, Kangaroo directly, uh, we can also um, 
bring this process here. So in order to have things uh, uh, clearer, I will leave all of these uh, uh, things inside this definition. So you will also have an idea of uh, what operation you must uh, do. Let me group this and turn it off. Uh, so basically, it's more or less, it's, uh, it's almost the same thing. Uh, we must, uh, first of all, um, explode uh, this, uh, this mesh. Or you can also, uh, in this case, deconstruct the mesh. It's, uh, it's faster. We must find a criterion for uh, separating the quads from the triangles. And one criterion could be the number of vertices that, uh, that we have uh, uh, per face. So you see that we have triangular faces, quad faces. Okay? So if we mesh explode this, We are going to get triangular meshes and quad meshes. You see that V is three or four. And then if we explode this, we can count the amount of vertices. So let's count this. If uh, we take a list length, list length will either be three or four as a value. So something like this. As we want to come up with uh, a pattern, uh, you see it's three, 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 four. We must flatten this in order to have a list of threes and fours, like this. And then we evaluate if uh, this number is equal to four, because I only want the quads. Okay. Um, so I want to see if this first number is equal to four. And if I take a look at the quality output, I will see false, 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 yes, and true, false, true, and so on. And so I can dispatch the list of faces or, or, or meshes. I can dispatch it according to the equality pattern. And so in list A, I will only have the quads. So if I take a mesh component here and plug the A output, I should only see the quads, yeah, if they are. I got rid of the triangles, okay? So um, these quads are the, the meshes that I want to uh, triangularize somehow. Now, if I triangulate these directly, I run into the same uh, situation because this is, uh, the, the orientation of the mesh depends on several factors. Uh, depends on the aspect ratio and the uh, topology orientation. So it's something that is not easy to, to maintain under control. So that's why we cannot work with this uh, triangulate um, uh, component. Uh, let's try and see what happens if we um, deconstruct these meshes again. Okay, so we should get once again to the actual set of vertices, but only for belonging to the quad faces. Okay, so you see that we are missing the, uh, the uh, outer edge and also the corner. Okay, so this is just the quad faces of, of our mesh. Um, and then we have the vertices. Okay, we have four vertices per uh, mesh. So let's, say, let's see what happens if I um, grab a list item So I only uh, uh, obtain the first vertex uh, of each quad mesh, of each quad face. So let's visualize once again the initial mesh, okay? So we get these uh, vertices here. These are the first points. And if I uh, take, for example, a component which is called a point list, I can uh, display a show a number correspond with correspondence to these, uh, to these vertices, okay? And I can also increase uh, this uh, um, size of this text with a slider. So these are vertices number zero, okay? Um, and we have four vertices. So the, the index of the list item can range between zero and three. Okay, something like this. So what I want to double check here is what happens when I look at these uh, quad faces, uh, eventually this is too big. If I look at these quad faces here, what happens if I change the index from zero to one? 
Okay, so what we must uh, double check is how these vertices are rotating. So you see that um, if we consider, for example, this quad face here and this quad face here, we already have a problem. Okay, because the vertex number zero for this face lies here at the bottom, but for this one lies here on the right. And so when I start to increase this value, you see that these are rotating, but they rotate in a different uh, fashion. So this is what's originating the problem for our mesh. Okay, so we should, I'm not going to do this, I just want to show you the door and then you enter, but uh, you should eventually um, reorient these faces in order for these vertices to be, let's say, coincident somehow. And this is going to eventually allow you to um, orient the diagonals in the proper directions. Okay, um, just so that we have another quick uh, check on this. If I try to triangulate the initial quad mesh, we should already have some kind of, uh, of problem. Uh, let me get rid of the preview of this of these things. Yes, you already see that tri by triangulating the first mesh, you, you already have this kind of orientation problem. And I repeat, this, this depends on, on many considerations that it's impossible to, to, to maintain under the under control. So this is something that you must struggle a little to um, adjust it here in Rhino and Grasshopper, but it might be quite easier to do this in a um, polygonal editor, like Blender or whatever you might want to use. So um, these problems are real life problems that you might uh, find when uh, trying to uh, reorganize the structure in a more, uh, let's say, proper way. Okay. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this doesn't mean that the simulation is not going to work. Uh, it, you only have this kind of weird aspect for, for your mesh. And so um, uh, we can uh, also turn this on. And despite the, or the weird orientation of these uh, elements, what we are interested into is the shell. So the shell, it's basically determined only by, by its thickness, actually. So this might be a secondary aspect for us in this moment, but just pay attention to this because it might be a major problem. So uh, in this case, we can run this uh, simulation. Um, and, uh, and yeah, see what happens. Uh, I think we can leave this running for, well, I wouldn't waste uh, much time in this case, eventually up to two iterations. So in the meanwhile, if you have questions, uh, this is a good moment for, for asking. Is everything okay? Andre, you always have questions. Please <laughs> help me. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you and okay, Ariel, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're the question man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I, w uh, I want to uh, make a question, uh, but uh, not about this mesh, but about uh, uh, c can we uh, make uh, uh, another kind of mesh? Uh, when the uh, when we have not uh, uh, not uh, the star nodes uh, but uh, star six or four or five element nodes, but only the T nodes, uh, like in the uh, reciprocal structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can. Um, it's just a matter. It's a, it's a, yeah. Is it a good question? <laughs> Well, actually, actually, um, in terms of analysis with with uh, uh, Karamba, yes, I know, I know, I know. This is out of analysis. Okay. No, no, no. It, it, it's uh, yeah. It's it, it, it's just the way you construct the system, right? There are some uh, uh, some plugins that allow creating automatically a reciprocal structure based on uh, on the existing system. Um, eventually, let me. What we already have two uh, iterations here, so we already. Have some kind of optimization. Let me quickly uh, uh, take a look at these results if, if it's already significant. I don't know, it's really uh, too few iterations. 
So uh, diffraction, this is always centimeters, so it's quite, always, also we saw that there was basically no deformation in the system. It's quite in dense as a structure. So it's quite resistant also because this is a catenary structure anchored to mm. the ground. It's a very rigid dome. Okay, so that's why you don't get this kind of, of significant uh, deformation. But anyway, let's reinstate this. And let's also quickly review what, what happened here. Um, so yeah, we, are, we already see that we have brighter yellow. I don't know if you get this uh, 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 tiny variance of, of uh, intensity of saturation of color, but this is lighter, this is lighter, so it's, it's starting to look uh, pretty good. Um, and also quickly, very quickly, uh, let me double check. Uh, we should also have uh, a solid object, yeah. Solid object, we should see that it's thicker at the base and thinner at the top. So perfect, yeah, everything gets corresponded to what we were, what I was thinking. So yes, uh, there are some tools that allow creating reciprocal structure and they should be automatic, yeah. So you see that these two are from, hmm, who knows what plugin it was, I think it was uh, Kangaroo itself. Uh, let me double check if it's uh, Kangaroo, the old version of Kangaroo maybe, or in the utility. Uh, Out control. Yeah, but it doesn't work because eventually this is a, a component, it's not a, a library, a full library. Okay. You, see, you, you can open it. But yes, it's, it's Kangaroo, actually, because you see it's, uh, it's basically uh, working on this uh, cluster. Reci uh, reciprocal in Kangaroo? I think, I think, yes. I think it's from Kangaroo, actually. Uh, it, it should be somewhere, somewhere here. Uh, I don't remember. I, oh, yeah, it's there. It's this. It's in mesh, mesh utility. Yeah, it's mesh utility and it's reciprocal structure. So uh, basically, you can. I don't it. see it in my. It, I don't see it's, in my it's kangaroo. A, it's the old kangaroo. I don't know if you have the. Ah, uh, uh, it's in, it's not uh, the second kangaroo. No, zero zero ninety nine. Well, well, actually, I do recommend that you install it uh, and you have it available because it, it's stupid. I know, but because kangaroo two is so much more powerful. But there are some utilities, like for example, um, the quad divide that I've been using. And also this reciprocal, also it's a, a good utility that you might want to use. The remesh itself and the mesh machine itself, they, they, are, they, they are very yeah. useful uh, tools. But anyway, uh, reciprocal structure is already present as a, a utility. Uh, let's see what type of result, because if I'm not wrong, it's not exactly uh, beautiful. <laughs> let's double check. Uh, it's quite slow, but yes, we start getting this kind of, uh, of result. Um, I think we can also uh, change the, uh, the angle in degrees. So if I tell this uh, 0 to uh, 45 and set this to 0, I think should go back to a little more uh, regular distribution. Yes, exactly. Uh, and then you can start rotating things. Um, the, uh, this is, oh, I should analyze the cluster. I think once I did this, but I honestly, I forgot uh, this. Okay. You, can you can double click on this. It's a, it's a cluster, so it opens up and you know what's, what are these things are doing. So it's, uh, uh, the first number is uh, division scaling. Okay, uh, so it affects the, the scale factor. See, so that's why we get this kind of, of shorter elements. But um, if we go back, so if we go back, this is a floating point number, of course. So let's um, uh, take this and give it a range between one and uh, two eventually. So this should allow to stretch this element. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that case, the degree is going to be a little more interesting, of course, because once we do this, we can have nice intersections uh, between these, uh, these elements. But yes, you can do this with, uh, with this component. And once you have this, you have the lines. 
and you can send these lines, for example, to a frame analysis. Okay, uh, uh, let me ask you one question. Uh, you know, uh, in this component, uh, yeah. uh, we've got uh, T joints, or we got uh, elements uh, that are laying uh, one on another. Uh, you mean you mean these two, for example? Yeah, of three or four. Yeah, three, yeah. Yes, three, three elements. Yeah. Yes. And 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 I mean, and... Uh, you know, uh, uh, I want a structure with uh, elements there are. Uh, uh, the, that are joining uh, one with another, not are laying uh, one on another, like uh, on the classic reciprocal structures. Yes, I think that as this is an automatic component, I think that you should always adjust the topology. Okay. You know? So once again, uh, you should uh, um, eventually, if we do something, well, allow me to, to to, to, to say it's quite stupid, like triangulate this mesh. Uh, as this thing is based on, on, on edges, finally, we should start getting, oh, well, no, actually, no. We, we must change the topology of this thing. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, because things are getting worse <laughs> and not better. <laughs> but anyway, yes, it's another, another time. It, it's once again a topological uh, approach that must be uh, adjusted. And, and this is something that I, I'm, uh, I have to tell you, it's, it's something that it's, uh, it, it can be not healthy to do this in Grasshopper and Rhino, you know, because okay. it's, it's, a, a very, uh, it's very difficult to uh, achieve this kind of result in Grasshopper Rhino, to control topology like in a perfect way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, but, by the way, I will leave it like here. Um, just remember that this is, uh, um, you in kangaroo, in kangaroo, zero zero ninety nine. Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Oh, oh. I will leave it like this. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, so I have a question. What happens when a mesh has openings holes? Do we have to take additional measures to solve it? Um, well, actually, no, nothing particular. Uh, the problem might be only uh, if uh, those holes are, well, free to move eventually during the, the simulation. I mean, if there are um, holes in the ceiling, for example, of these domes, um, maybe uh, you could have some, but I, I don't think you have consequences because it is up to the um, uh, uh, structural analysis software. Uh, it will solve the, the problem by itself. Uh, the problem eventually is that if you have holes that you want to uh, anchor somehow, then it might be a little tricky to um, isolate the uh, the proper vertices. Uh, but I, I don't think it's uh, it's a major problem because uh, in that case, uh, uh, let me quickly create a mesh with an internal hole. Um, so let's uh, mesh 3D face, not taking into account the shape right now. So something like uh, this and this and this and this this and finally this. So let's take all these meshes. Um, I'm going to save the file because just so you never know. <laughs> so let's import once again. Um, well, actually, we were only using weld mesh here. So I can join these meshes here in, in Rhino and then import them uh, in, uh, in Russell. So you see, everything is recalculating. I hope I turned off the simulation in, uh, in uh, Kangaroo. <laughs> I think I didn't because I see it's running quite slow. Yes, it's on. Uh, so let me turn it off. Okay. Uh, we are also diagonalizing it, so there are many things happening right now. Uh, this is the actual called division. This is the actual di diagonalized mesh. 
Um, in this moment, what's happening is that we have a naked point, and finally we are uh, using uh, these points here. Uh, you see that um, actually this is uh, uh, this is tricky uh, because uh, uh, this, the the method that I used here for um, let's say extracting only the naked points that are touching one edge uh, is not working properly. Is not detecting the inner points because we have two naked edges right now. Uh, so let me hide this. We have the outer edge and the uh, and the interior edge. Okay, and so when I uh, do this curve closest point, uh, the majority of these points is being projected along the uh, the outer uh, edge. Okay, so that's why we we only have these uh, outer points. Uh, eventually, uh, not sure, but if I flatten this like this and eventually graft the curves, probably I will get also the inner vertices. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so now we have all the, uh, the outer point. If I do this, I'm, I don't have any major problem because uh, let me control E this and control Q this, because actually what I'm about to do is anchor also the inner points. So if I reset and run, I will have this like donut dome like this. So this is not a major problem. Uh, but if I don't do this, if I want to use only the outer edge, for example, uh, so between these two, I need to understand what is the inner and outer edge. So let's uh, take, for example, a dispatch and let's uh, dispatch the joint edge. And I need to understand what's who's who here. So uh, this is the inner edge. So if I want to anchor only along the outer edge, I will take a uh, list B, connect it here to, to the curve process point curve. And now this is free to, to rise up. Okay. So this is something that eventually we must double check what happens in terms of Fox structural analysis, but I don't see any uh, major problem uh, even in this case. So let's say that we stop this. I don't know. I don't care about the actual uh, perfect result, so it's false. Control E, and uh, you see that we should have, uh, let's quickly check the stress line. You see that everything works perfectly. So there is no major problem with uh, this kind of operation. Eventually, you would have some variation, of course, in thicknesses and, and uh, the structural aspect of this uh, shell that you must recalculate, of course. But you see that everything goes fine. But the, the observation maybe it's it's all once again topological. Uh, try to avoid uh, as as this software is uh, is always doing a triangulation. Try to avoid flat triangle at the corner. So always try to diagonalize the mesh first. Uh, even if this uh, uh, returns this kind of weird distribution for this for the diagonals, in the end the the structural analysis remember that is based on faces because. Uh, the uh, the thickness, the height of the shell, the shell structure is assigned by face. So it doesn't matter basically what's the actual orientation. But if you want also to, to run a frame analysis, I would recommend that you um, find out, uh, find a way to uh, regularize this kind of uh, um, diagonal uh, 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 beams or, or edges, okay? because this will affect the, the frame analysis.